In time, perhaps, we will mark the memory of September the 11th in stone and metal, something we can show children as yet unborn to help them understand what happened on this minute and on this day. But for those of us who live through these events, the only marker we'll ever need is the tick of a clock at the 46th minute of the 8th hour of the 11th day. We remember where we were and how we felt. We remember the dead and what we owe them. We will remember what we lost and what we found. And here we are 20 years later. This words about remembering about what we owe to the people we lost on September 11th is true as ever. Tomorrow on the 20th anniversary, President Bush will speak in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where Flight 93 went down. President Obama will be at Ground Zero in New York. President Biden plans to visit both those sacred sites tomorrow, as well as the Pentagon. Joining our coverage is Elizabeth Bumiller, New York Times Assistant Managing Editor and the Washington Bureau Chief. She was the White House correspondent for the New York Times on 9-11. Mark Mazzetti's here, New York Times Washington investigative correspondent. He was a Pentagon correspondent for U.S. News and World Report on 9-11. Our friend Donnie Deutsch is here, host of On Brand, uh, the On Brand podcast and a New Yorker. And the Reverend Al Sharpton is still with us. Um, we're still trying to get Mark shot up, Elizabeth. But we were covering the end of the war in Afghanistan. And Mark was on the air with us and said, you know, I'm thinking about covering the Pentagon on 9-11. And I thought about how so many of us have been at the since that day. And I'm going to put up your story on the front page of the New York Times on September 12th. You were covering my old boss, George W. Bush. Um, and that was your story down there in the bottom left corner. You covered the president. And I, I just want to ask you about that day. How often you think about it, what you remember from it, and how it changed how you do the job you have now. Well, I think about it, I've thought about it a lot the last few days. I was just um, downtown right at the Washington Bureau, and uh, which is just a few blocks from the White House, as you know. And I remember that day, I had just moved to Washington. It was my second day on the White House beat. September 10th was a Monday. That was my first day. This was Tuesday. David Sanger, who I covered the White House with, was uh, in Florida with President Bush. And I was planning on having a very slow day because the president was out of town and there wasn't a lot going on. I remember walking into the Washington Bureau, and the first thing I saw was the security guard who said, did you hear a plane just hit the World Trade Center? And I, my first thought was, well, I'm not going to have a lot to do today because that's a giant metro story for the New York Times. By the time I got up to the top, to the to our floor, um, the day editor at the time told me there's another plane that's hit the second tower. Uh, I think you need to get to the White House. This was my new beat. So I remember thinking, okay. So I walked over to the White House, but I couldn't get in because by that point, there were people just streaming out. The Secret Service was screaming, get out, get away, get away. And I ended up sitting on the sidewalk. I think it was H Street talking to people, you know, National Security Council staffers, whoever, talking to them on the street um, as we saw the smoke rise up from the Pentagon. And then I remember sitting next to a woman from the White House staff who had a little black and white television set on her lap. Don't forget, this was long before cell phones, long before, you know, uh, cell phone video. And I watched with her in black and white as the Twin Tower, one of the towers fell. And after that, I remember being you know, very alarmed. And I went back to the bureau and Jill Abramson, who was then our bureau chief, assembled us all downstairs in the conference room and said to us, I'll never forget what she said, this is what we do now. And she was right. For the next number of years, that is what we did. Mark Mazzetti is with us now. I gave you credit for inspiring this segment. I, I was saying that we were on the air when the war in Afghanistan ended, when the Pentagon announced that war had ended, and you made a comment about having been at the Pentagon, covering the Pentagon on 9-11. And I, I just wanted to take some time to ask you about that day, ask you about covering the Pentagon in the days and weeks that followed. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the, uh, about four months earlier, I was asked by my editor at U.S. News World Report whether I wanted to cover the Pentagon. I said, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've never covered defense or national security issues. Um, I would probably be in it over my head. Um, and I remember him saying, um, don't worry, uh, there's nothing happening. You'll be fine. Um, and then uh, the day of 9-11, I was actually supposed to be in the Pentagon that morning with an inter doing an interview, and um, it got rescheduled the night before for later in that day. Um, so I went to my office and um, 
watch the planes hit uh, the Pentagon, uh, sorry, the, the Twin Towers, and then and there was a report that the, and a bomb had gone off at the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. So uh, immediately, uh, you know, tried to get my get to the Pentagon as quickly as possible. It, had, it was very difficult uh, getting across the 14th Street Bridge. Uh, it looked like a, you know, a horror movie. And so I ran across the bridge and spent the entire day covering the scene and then ended up being in Afghanistan a few months after that. I want to read something, Elizabeth, that, that you reported on and wrote, um, I guess, about eight weeks after September 11th. Um, about one of the memorials. I played one when we came in, and there, there were many. Uh, you write, wrote this. When the dignitaries had left the platform, anyone still up there could find another memorial. Inscriptions scrawled on the wooden railing of the platform, a kind of graffiti of remembrance at the site of a mass grave. Mr. Bush and the others had stood right in front of the railing while the ceremony was held. Dear Daddy, began one inscription. I miss you so much. It's so hard with you not around. Steve began another. I love you so much. You gave me in our 22 and a half years more than I could ever have asked for. We'll have you forever in our hearts. The kids and I will never forget all the wonderful memories you have given us. Rest in peace and know how very much we will always love you. And another written from parents to a son who had been a firefighter. You were our shining star in everything we did. Love mom and dad. How do you... Report on a story like that without being crushed by it. You know, it's so funny. I don't remember that as well <laughs> as well. I remember. Obviously, I, I'm being crushed by it now. But I, I, what I do remember, um, I remember that he went up. It was around the time of the UN General Assembly. Yeah, I November twelfth. President stopped yeah. it. Right. He stopped there first. And it was very haunting. And obviously, I just spent some time reading those those remembrances. Um, uh, you know, a lot of I do remember. Here's what I remember. September 14th, I was on my first flight on Air Force One ever was up to ground zero with President Bush it was this. Remember, that was that first yeah. flight. He went up on a Friday after 9-11. And we had we had um fighter jets escorting Air Force One. We landed someplace in New Jersey. It was an Air Force base. And then uh, we took um, helicopters um, in, in, into the city. And it was the first view I'd had in person. And it was still this acrid smell in the air and this huge amounts of black smoke still coming up from, from lower Manhattan. And, um, what I re and I had been City Hall Bureau Chief before that. And I had gone to the deli at, in, in the bottom of the World Trade Center a lot for lunch. And so I was back there in my old stomping grounds. And I just remember not recognizing any of it was such a mess. And I remember, too, that... Um, uh, the, the the sludge and the ash and the mud there and um, and just being so haunted by what it the destruction and the ash um, and I never for, forgot that day and you just showed a, a, a video of, of President Bush with the with the bullhorn this is what happens when you're a reporter and you're like trying to to get through the day. I was right there at his feet. But all I could think about at the time was, how am I going to file? How am I going to file? <laughs> well, I guess the answer is, that's a long answer. That's sort of what gets you through the day as a reporter, just worrying about getting your story out. And that was a really long day. Our cell phones weren't working. I was filing, you know, verbal pool reports to the White House because I was the pool reporter, um, and uh, they were coming out. It was my first White House pool report as a um, as a you know New York Times White House reporter, and because I was phoning it in, um, the uh, and the White House was typing uh, and sending it out. There was like huge grammar mistakes, huge <laughs> spelling mistakes, and it went out under my name as a New York Times reporter. So I thought, uh, and it was late. It was so. What I remember a lot about is just trying to be a journalist on that day. It was much later when I saw. Um, um, a, a memorial to a man on my street in Westchester County who had died, one of my neighbors who had died, um, that I, it was really, it's, it, it hit me more personally because I was kind of a, being a professional that day. And that's kind of how you keep it together. It's a long answer.